It's still the breakfast on Plus TV Africa uh, right now. We're taking our second hot topic, which will be the final thing we'll do this uh, morning. Like we read on the, uh, of the press from uh, the headlines on our national dailies, and we saw the clip yesterday uh, when the screening was done. Balarabe Abbas collapsed during screening for ministerial uh, position. We know that it happened yesterday. We often talk about the importance of physical and mental capacity of candidates to do the jobs they campaign for. Now, uh, we're going to be talking with Nick Agule to look at this uh, question of someone collapsing just at a screening. Nick Agule, good morning and welcome to the show. Uh, yes, good morning and good morning to our viewers. Okay. Unfortunately, I don't know if it's the volume of my computer is I can't hear you very clearly. Okay. I mean, loud enough. Maybe I should be a bit louder. Can you hear me better now? This is better now, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so now, yesterday, there was screening for the ministerial nominees, and one of them, Abbas from Kaduna, who replaced Nasir El Rufai, um, slumped. Oh, no, let me not use the word slumped. He fainted. Uh, in the course of the uh, screening. Uh, they said it's exhaustion. So far, that's what we heard. And let me just ask you for your comments on what happened. He fainted and was revived at the clinic. The, the clinic. We haven't heard so much details about it, how he's feeling right now and whatever happened there. But we know that he fainted. What are your comments? Uh, uh, the first comment is that I want to wish the candidate for ministerial appointment well. I don't know what is uh, his medical situation now, but I hope that he's okay and he's now fully fit uh, because the Senate has already approved the nominations. And so I hope that he's now fully fit to take up his office as an honorable minister of the federal government of Nigeria. So that is my first comment that uh, I wish him well. But then uh, it also comes to mind the challenges in healthcare generally that we have in Nigeria. There are a lot of us in Nigeria who are going about without knowing the status of our health. And it's important that government should provide the health care facilities around the country so that people can access health care. That's where the government has complete database of each and every citizen or resident. And like, I mean, I, I live in the UK, you will see that the National Head Service, the NHS, will send me letters to say that you are due for this vaccination, you are due for this test, you are due for this check, ensuring that preventive healthcare is better than curative healthcare. So in Nigeria, we don't have public health care, neither do we have uh, hospital health care, you know, and these are things that play out. So I, I, I'm not the honorable minister's uh, doctor, so I cannot say precisely what happened. Could it be that he succumbed to the pressure of facing the Senate or are there underlying medical issues that he has? But either way, it comes down to Nigeria having a not only a, a total and and comprehensive healthcare facilities available to the to the to the residents. But this is something that governments all over the world don't let go into the private sector. So even if you go to uh, economies like the US, the UK, where 
you know, the economies are being run by the private sector, you still see that government is taking care of education and healthcare. Those are the two sectors that most governments in the world don't let go into the private sector. And, and we want the Nigerian government to do the same. Mm, okay, but if you watch the ministerial screening, um, maybe you have general comments on that. Those, the things that struck me, uh, too, I've already mentioned them when we're talking of the press. Um, first of all, like uh, political uh, office holders, we always say that physical and mental capacity of the candidates uh, for the jobs they campaign is very important. And we were asking ourselves, should this not be the same for even appointees? that are in government. You, you make someone an ambassador to a country and he goes to that country and falls sick and throughout his tenure he's a sick man in the bed. He cannot do his job. You make someone a minister who uh, is going to be fainting all the time uh, because he has a medical condition. He cannot be on his feet. He cannot even attend the Federal Executive Council meeting which will require him to come and give reports. He will be sending proxies and all that. Shouldn't this be a requirement as well? And then uh, we had a young, a young woman of 37 who was nominated as well to be a minister. And in, in trying to defend her, the Senate president said that this should not be, she should not be grilled that much because she is the face of the renewed hope because the president wants youths to be a part of the government. So uh, she should not be asked a, a lot of questions. And it got me worried. Like... If she will fail, can there be no youth in Nigeria that can answer the questions if that is a, a criteria of becoming a minister? And then the person who fainted that was still given the nod, uh, what if he, like you said, he has an underlying medical condition that will not enable him make uh, the right decisions or do his job well? How far should we take our screening for uh, job positions, political job positions, or office, uh, of, uh, politi uh, public offices in Nigeria. How far should we go? Should we be taking a bow, or should we be doing uh, extra things uh, to make sure we get the best brains? I think uh, you are actually very correct, and align with uh, your views. And in that in direct answer to your question. My view and personal opinion is that the ministerial screening or whatever screening that goes on to the Senate or to the National Assembly is a joke. It's a session in comedy. You know, and we see this thing play out before the international community. And we want them to take us serious. You know, because look, first and foremost, you receive a, a list of ministerial candidates without knowing which portfolios that are, they are going to be assigned to. So you see the Senate say, Azumi, you are appointed as minister for this. You know, Azumi, based on your CV, you are appointed as minister for this. What, what are you going to do for the country? And the answer of that, the people don't get appointed into the ministerial positions to which they have provided answers to the Senate. Mm. So for me, that is a joke. It's a complete joke. You know, it's it, it just like a session in comedy being watched not only by Nigeria, <laughs> but by the international community. So if it has to take the, a change in the Constitution to force the hands of a president that they must forward the list of ministerial candidates to the Senate together with the portfolios that they are going to take. Those who make the, the, the case that, oh, uh, the president can transfer the ministers and all of that. How about things like the central bank governor? The president doesn't just send a list of, uh, like, like recently, the Senate screened the, the, the central bank governor and I think uh, four or five deputy governors. Why didn't the president just send a list of five or six to the Senate to be screened? Then later on, he will now appoint who will be the central bank governor, who will be deputy governor. No, he sent the list attaching their portfolios to the Senate. The same thing with EFCC, 
The same thing with uh, ICPC. All those appointments that require uh, the National Assembly assent, they are sent together with the portfolio. It's not as if like, the president sends a, a list of five candidates to the Senate, and then they don't even know who is the one that is going to be the EFCC chairman. And afterwards, they say, okay, we're appointing. No. He, he says with the portfolio, and this has to also be the case for the ministerial appointments. They must go with the portfolio so that the Senate will hold them to account to the promises that they make during the screening. Because if the man say, if the minister or uh, the minister, ministerial designate for power, for instance, says that I am going to increase power supply in Nigeria from this miserly and beggarly 3,000 megawatts. What uh, UAE is supplying to 1 million people, we are supplying it to 200 million people. If that candidate says, I'm going to increase that power supply from 3,000 to 10,000 within one year, then that same Senate will summon him after one year and say, you promised that power is going to get to 10,000 megawatts. Where is the power? And if there is no power, we ask for your for, for your second from the cabinet. That is the kind of thing we should be looking at. I'm not sending a, a, an amorphous list of people. Uh, look at the, the, the Minister of Solid Minerals now. Everybody thought he was going to be Minister for Information. And at the Senate, they were asking him questions about Minister for Information, only for him to be sent to Solid Minerals. Is that not a total waste of time of the Senate? So that is a clear joke. And now to the other point that you raised, which is whether medical uh, examination should be part of the screening exercise. I agree with that totally. You know, in Nigeria, we have been unlucky. Let me say unlucky because for some reason, we have had president in the immediate past who has spent a huge amount of time on healthcare. So we know uh, President Yaradua was uh, uh, struck with illness. President uh, Buhari was struck with illness. And, and, and uh, President Tinubu now, you know, he left New York. And for like a week, we didn't know where he was. You know, and, and uh, he, you know, people, some people say he was in France which we know is the destination for. So we actually need medical examination. You know, like in the US, the presidents do yearly medical examination of fitness. And the result is published so that Americans will know the health status of their president. And if you are an individual and you don't want your health status to be in the public domain, please stay at home. Don't come and captain this ship that we all are on board in Nigeria as a leader. And then the other uh, matter that you raised, which is concerning the, the young appointees that were asked to take a bow and go, is still part of the comedy session that the Senate engages in, in the name of screening. If, if somebody is 20 years old and they have been uh, designated as a ministerial appointee, you must dress them. You must ask them what they are bringing on the table. You cannot just say they should go because they are young. What lessons are we teaching to the upcoming generation? Do you understand? Because no matter your age, you have to show course that you are capable of handling this office that you have been given. And if you cannot handle the office, then of course the, the office should go to somebody who is more competent than you are. So in summation, the, the Senate engages in comedy, and it is high time they change this thing because it's not, us, not, not only us in Nigeria who are watching this thing. The whole world is watching it, and I don't think the rating of us will be high. Okay, just a final one. Uh, now we have 48 ministers uh, in a country of 36 states. Even if the Constitution says that uh, every state must have a minister, but we have 48 48 is 12 ministers more than the number of states that we have. Even if you include the federal capital territory, it's still more than 10 of uh, the, the, the territories that we have. So I'd like your comment. Are we going anywhere or we're going backwards? Because uh, one of the cardinal points we were hoping to see was a, a cut down in governance, a cut down in the way monies go 
these offices are duplicated and we have minister, minister for state, we have this and that, 48 now that we will be paying humongous salaries for doing the things that may not be uh, even important for us. Do you think we are progressing or going backwards? We are going backwards. Nigeria in totality is going backwards. Because I will, I will soon be 60 years old. I, I will be 58 in March. So I have grown up in the Nigeria of post-colonial days. So I was born in 1966, meaning six years after independence, I was born. And the Nigeria experienced in those days and the Nigerians that I experience now in my adulthood, in my old age, are two different Nigerians. And I can say authoritatively, as a Nigerian who has lived in this country, experienced this country, even as I speak to you now, I am in Makodi in Benue State. That's why I'm speaking to you now. So I can authoritatively tell anybody that the Nigeria I grew in was a better area. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. The Nigeria I grew up in, I grew up in a place called Boko in Benue State. In Boko, in the, in the 70s, we had pipe bone water running. It was, the pipe bone water was not running into our homes, but it was running to public taps that were spread across the town of Boko. And we will go and open the tap and fetch water that will be smelling very fresh with the uh, chlorine or what was that they were using to treat the water. You understand? We had education that was effective and comprehensive. I was given free books, free writing materials. We had healthcare that was comprehensive and effective. When I attended the General Hospital in Boko, from the uh, cutting of my card, my registration of my card, to me seeing a doctor to consult for me, for the, to the doctor ordering my test, to the doctor reviewing my test and giving me medication, even when I went on admission at the hospital, I did not pay a dime, not one dime did my parents pay. And when I was on admission, every morning, the nurses would come and change my bed sheets into freshly laundered bed sheets that will be smelling so nice. There were no security issues. You know, I, 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 as, as an 11 year old, I mean 12 year old, I, I left Boko to go to one place alone to go and start secondary education. There was no fence in any building, there was no fence. The only building that had fence in Boko was the prisons in Boko, you know? That was the Nigeria I grew up in. The Nigeria today is a far dirty Nigeria, a far, a far more painful Nigeria, a Nigeria where even the government hospitals now, you cannot go and assess healthcare there, except you have, you have to pay. So if you don't have to pay, then the government hospitals that now became consulting clinics, as Abacha said in his school speech, they are no longer even doing the consultation again for anybody. There are government hospitals that you're working now, you'll be asked to bring 30,000, 50,000, 100,000. If you're talking about surgery, they are calling 1 million for you. Like we recently put money together for a cancer patient to go to Federal Medical Center in Kefi and pay 1.7 million for, for surgery. Tell me how many Nigerians can afford 1.7 million to go to a government hospital? A government hospital that is being funded by the budget of Nigeria. That is the Nigeria we have today. So this Nigeria we have today is a far retrogressive Nigeria. And, and the, 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 the worst case scenario here is that we don't even see a hope of any change in where we are going. We continue to march into the bush every day. And President Tinibu is marching us into the bush as far as uh, ministerial appointments are concerned. Because he doesn't need 48 ministers. He doesn't need them. We are dealing with a government that is using almost all its revenue to, to service debts. 
So where is the money to not look after 47 convoys or 48? 48 sets of aids, 48 offices to manage, 48 uh, 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 extra codes that will be paid and all of that. They didn't need it. In fact, 36 ministers is even too much. The United States, where the president just came back from, uh, from the UN General Assembly, they have a thing like 15 departments. If they are too much, they are 18. So if we have 20 departments, and the United States is an economy that is multiple times Nigeria's economy. Their population is far more. Now, Nigeria is only like about 10% of the size of the US in terms of land mass. And they have only like 15 or 18 departments. The same thing happens in the UK. So if President Tinubu is asking us to tighten our best and go through these austere times, of fuel uh, price increase, of forest um, uh, 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 crisis and everything, why is he not leading by example? Why is the president not leading by example? By cutting his own expenditure and saying, I don't really need 36 ministers, but since the constitution forces my hands, let me appoint 36. Why 48? There's absolutely no need for that. And, right. I, and I expect the president I expect the president to be sending an executive bill to the National Assembly to cut down on ministerial uh, slots to something like 15 or 18 at the most, mm. not him going above board. Okay, uh, well, that is where we have to uh, wrap it up, Nika Gule. Thank you for your time this morning. Okay, we were talking with Nick Agule, public affairs analyst. He was talking to us from Makordi Benwe State. And this is where we draw the curtain on today's uh, episode of The Breakfast. My name is Nyamgul Agaji saying thank you to you on behalf of my entire team.